And we're back once again at the book of Judges, chapter 1. I believe we left off at verse 24. And the spies saw a man come forth out of the city, and they said unto him, Show us, we pray thee, the entrance into the city, and we will show you mercy. And when he showed them the entrance into the city, they smote the city with the edge of the sword, but they let go the man and all his family. And the man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and called the name thereof Luz, which is the same name thereof unto this day. Notes. This man was determined to build what God had demanded to be destroyed. He had an opportunity to know the God of Israel but rebelled against that opportunity. Now Rahab's action was the reverse. Remember her? She had her family where... Uh, the only one saved out of the doom of Jericho. I mean, she had him in the right position. But Grace changed her heart, and she joined the people of God. That's the difference maker right there, my friend. She trusted in the Lord, and this guy decided he wanted to go off and do his own thing. Stupid choice. Verse 27. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Sheen and her towns, nor Tanak and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Ablim and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. Verse 28. I'm having to clear my throat. And it came to pass, when Israel was strong, that they put the Canaanites to tribute and did not utterly drive them out. Mm. Notes. Now, as failure after failure is recorded, it doesn't mean that Israel didn't have the power to drive out these heathenistic people, but rather that they just simply disobeyed God and let them remain, which proved to be a huge disaster, to say the least, exactly as the Lord said would happen. Instead of Israel winning the heathen to Jehovah, the heathen won the people of God to their heathen idols. It is the same with the modern church right now. Now, while the Bible does not teach isolation from the world, it does indeed teach separation. We are in the world, but never to be of the world. The ship is in the water, so to speak, but big time trouble comes, and greatly so, when the water gets in the ship. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18, and chapter 7 of the same book, verse 1. Pretty good notes, if I do say so myself. Verse 29. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Verse 30. Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, nor the inhabitants of Nahalal, but the Canaanites dwelt among them and became tributaries. Mm. Verse 31. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of, of Akko, nor the inhabitants of Zidon, nor, uh, nor of Alab, nor of Akzib, nor of Helba, nor of Aphik, and nor of Rehob. But the Asherites dwell among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, nor the inhabitants of Beth Anath. But he dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and of Beth Anath became tributaries unto them. Verse 34. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. Notes. Hmm. Now, obviously, this is a very big problem. As stated, if the enemy is allowed to remain, he will ultimately make a slave out of the believers. Now the situation had become so bad in Israel that the tribe of Dan could not even live in the valley or plant crops therein. They were virtually prisoners in their own land. And so it is. Verse 35. But the Amorites would dwell in Mount Herez and Aijalon and in Shalbim. Yet the hand of the house of Joseph prevailed so that they became tributaries. Notes. Once again, and obviously so, they should have driven them out at least. Verse 36. And the coast of the Amorites was from the going up to Akrabim, from the rock, and upward. Chapter 2. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bachim and said, 
I made you to go up out of Egypt, and he have brought you unto the land which I swore unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Notes. Now, actually, this is a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. And to make more notes of it, the Lord has never broken a covenant, but most definitely a man breaks covenant repeatedly. Verse 2. And you shall make no league with the inhabitants of the land. You shall throw down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Notes. Now, this is a question that the Lord is going to continue to ask until time itself pretty much shuts down for believers. As stated, if we make a league with the world, the world doesn't become more Christian, but rather the Christian becomes more worldly. Take a look at the church nowadays. They preach anything but the cross nowadays, am I right? When's the last time you heard a message on it? Do you even hear one this Christmas? Verse 3. <laughs> Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare unto you. Notes. In other words, if Israel disobeyed the Lord, he would withhold his help, and in that case they would start doing things that are wrong, and Israel, Israel was going to fail. Read the book of Lamentations a little bit later. Verse 4. And it came to pass, when the angel of the Lord spoke these words unto, unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. Notes. Now this, as to exactly how the Lord delivered this word to Israel, we aren't told here. And perhaps he used maybe a high priest. However, any guess is but speculation. Anyways, verse 5. And they called the name of that place Weeping, which is Bachim, and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. Notes. Now exactly where Bachim was, we aren't told. But many think it was very, very near the city, the ancient city of Shiloh. In fact, the sacrifices were probably carried out at Shiloh. It seems that the uh, people repented. However, it is also obvious that their repentance was extremely shallow, to say the least. Verse 6. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. Notes. Now, obviously, this was after Joshua's little farewell address given to us in chapter 24 of his book. And he died very shortly afterwards. Verse 7. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being an hundred and ten years old. Notes. This happened before the events of verses 1 through 5. Uh, obviously, this is a recapping. Verse 9. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Heres, in the mountain of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gaash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Notes. Now, <laughs> this statement about Joshua and the elders is repeated here designedly by the Holy Spirit in order to justify the righteous uh, indignation and in words of the angel of Yahweh. Verse 11. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. Notes. Some six times in this phrase is used, uh, is used in this book of Judges. And in all of these six passages, the definite article, the evil should be used in... It means idolatry. Chapter 2, verse 11. Chapter 3, verse 7. Chapter 12. Chapter uh, 4, verse 1. Chapter 6, verse 1. Chapter 10, verse 6. Chapter 13, verse 1. To make it very, very short, God's a little bit T.O.'d over some things. And we must pick up in Judges chapter 2, verse 12. Thank you very much, and God bless.